the age of the pyramids. What do those words evoke? Who has not been awed by the sheer size of the Great Pyramid and the mysteries of the Sphinx? Or contemplated the massive amount of labor required to build these Egyptian behemoths? Herodotus, on his journey of discovery in the 5th century BC, characterized Lower Egypt as the gift of the river. He remarked that no country possesses so many wonders. He recounted how the ruler, Kephren, built the second of the pyramids at Giza next to the Great Pyramid of his predecessor and father, Cheops. It's this early king, known to the Greeks as Kephren and known in Egyptian as Khafre or Khafra, who left us some of the greatest artworks of the ancient world. Khafre's Sphinx is the earliest colossal sculpture of a human in the world. Look closely at its features and you see they are most like Khafre's statue of himself. That statue was meant for the mortuary temple connected to his pyramid the temple for the worship of the departed king and his reign. This sculpture, now in the Cairo Museum, exemplifies the artistic splendors of Egyptian civilization. Egypt's early dynastic period, which we call the Old Kingdom, is the age of the pyramids, and it is divided into dynasties of related rulers. Kephren, or Khafre, belonged to one of the high points of Egyptian art and culture, the fourth dynasty. He reigned from about 2555 to 2532 BC, approximately 500 years after the creation of the Narmer palette. The palette of that first king, Narmer, which we discussed in the last lecture, documents the beginning of kingship and its symbols in Egypt. The palette gives visual acknowledgement to the new status of the king at a moment of dynamic change, the king is depicted actively as the one who unites the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt, and as a force defeating chaos while restoring order to the world. His power is reinforced in this artwork by metaphor, scale, and action. For instance, the bull goring a town's fortification represents the power of Narmer as king. Now we'll see how those early concepts and symbols continue to be manipulated in the first full flowering of Egyptian grandeur. Picture a land of hot sun and endless sand where you depend upon a river to give life to all. Perhaps by chance you discover that the dry climate is well suited to the preservation of a human body after death. Bodies naturally became desiccated by the hot sand with the apparent ability to last forever. In Egypt, however, after stone and brick tombs began to be built, the bodies no longer dried by direct contact with the sand. So mummification was developed in order to prevent the decomposition of the corpse. The idea of an afterlife was planted like a seed amongst the people. What really happens after we die? Every culture on earth contemplates death and asks this question. Most have some answer, but the vision of an afterlife is often vague and shadowy, like the Western conception of heaven. Egypt, in contrast, seems to have come up with the most concrete and colorful ideas about life after death. They believed, for instance, that you would need to eat and drink and plow your fields for an eternity. Much of the art that survives from Egypt, in fact, had a funerary purpose. Mummies and pyramids, of course, are the first thing one thinks of when ancient Egypt is mentioned. But it is the artworks created for the tomb that are unmatched in splendor. Just think of Tutankhamun. Why did the Egyptians go to such great lengths to prepare for death? People often think of Egyptians as a death-obsessed culture, but this is far from the truth. The Egyptians were really a death-denying culture. They loved life. They believed that by making the proper preparations and undertaking an elaborate series of rituals and provisioning for a tomb, they would be granted life for eternity. 
they wish to continue with the same joyous life in the time after death. And so they put more effort into that afterlife of eternity than perhaps any other culture the world has known, creating in stone what was ephemeral in life. The statue you see here is part of that preparation for death. The death of a pharaoh was naturally a much bigger event than anyone else's death. He prepared for immortality as a god and actually became the god Osiris, king of the underworld in the afterlife. The pyramids show the lengths that the old kingdom Egyptians were willing to go to to ease this transition of the pharaoh into his eternal life. The pyramids are, in essence, resurrection machines for the living Horus, the king, to ascend like the sun and be reborn, becoming Osiris in the realm of the dead. The pyramids were the center of a religion as well as a tomb. The pyramid texts of the Old Kingdom, which were inscribed on mortuary temple walls, bring to life some of these beliefs. You have gone away to live. You have not gone away to die. And they continue with a vivid passage for what should happen in resurrection. Oh ho, oh ho, raise yourself, O king, receive your head, collect your bones, gather your limbs together, throw off the earth from your flesh, receive your bread which does not grow moldy, and your beer which does not grow sour. From this, you can tell that the body itself was enormously important in the Egyptians' sometimes literal view of the afterworld. They believed the body had to be mummified and preserved as the home for the soul of the deceased. Death led to renewal, but preparations had to be made to ensure it. Without the body, eternal life was harder to imagine. But Egyptians realized that not all bodies would or could continue to exist for eternity, so they found a way to guarantee this immortality in stone. A statue or relief made in the image of a person could then be an alternative space inhabited by that person's life force or soul in the afterlife. It was, in effect, a spare or reserve body for the individual. Insurance, really. The statue had to be inscribed with the name of that person to be effective because Egyptians believed the name was essential for eternal life. Offering inscriptions providing for eternal food and drink were inscribed on walls. They sustained the person in the afterlife. Incantations and hymns which assured resurrection were inscribed also. Let's look at the statue of King Khafre more closely now. After that, I will set it in its context because the artwork belonged to an extensive funerary complex of which the pyramid was only one part. You see before you the seated figure of a king carved from beautiful hard diorite quarried far to the south in Nubia. The stone is highly polished, bringing out the natural striations in it and seeming to give it life. Here is a piece of Labradorite, an inclusion in the stone, which shows a play of colors. This is the result of light diffraction. And you can see here the brilliant sparkle that results from the play of the light. The artwork was found in 1860, buried in a pit in the Valley Temple connected to the Pyramid of Khafre. There were six other statues like it, all fragmentary when found. The statue is 168 cent centimeters, or about five and a half feet tall. My height. Khafre is seated on a throne, completely frontal and with great dignity. His face wears an expression of divine grace, serene and unchanging. He looks straight forward, almost as if he were looking past us. He has high cheekbones and rounded cheeks. His nose is straight and wider at the nostrils and tip. His eyes are set into his head in a very naturalistic fashion, and the orbs and brow area are very softly and sensitively rendered. 
Khafre projects majesty in his pose, his head held erect and his arms at rest. One hand rests palm down on his left knee, the other holds in his fist some sort of material, the ends of which are carved in relief on his leg. You'll notice that he wears a distinctive headdress, a striped headcloth, which is called the nemes, a symbol of kingship. It has pleated lappets or folds on the headdress, which extend almost to his nipples. His brow is crowned by a uraeus, the stylized upright form of a striking cobra carved in relief. That's another symbol of royalty. His ears are softly modeled to project slightly to the sides of the nemes. He wears the false beard, which is emblematic of kingship. Narmer had this beard as well. Khafre wears a kilt known as the shendit, and its pattern of pleats echoes the pleats of the lappets and even the decoration of the throne, the lion's claws below. By contrast, the smooth, wide surface of his chest presents an ideal and youthful body, wide at the shoulders, robustly muscled, and perfect. The arms are muscular, too. The closed position of the hands, including the clenched fist, speaks of his authority, as opposed to images of victims whose palms we see upturned in submission. Khafre's legs are well-muscled and his calves and feet perfectly and completely formed. The throne he sits on has lion heads modeled at the level of his knees, and their feet are carved below at the bottom. The lions are yet another symbol of kingship. Let's stop a moment and think about the visual impact of this essentially barely clothed male body. The king on the Narmer palette is shown similarly vigorous, smiting and in action, muscles and all. If you recall, Mesopotamian ideals of kingship included having a perfect, vigorous, and potent king, one whose body communicated messages of strength and power. We know that perfection of the body was important for a ruler from the cuneiform texts, too. The very earliest image of a ruler from Mesopotamia depicts these essentially male characteristics, including the beard. The emphasis on an idealized and youthful body continues in many cultures, including the Greeks, and not least of all, our own. Here the two, modern and ancient, do meet. So, visual symbols of power, whether encoded in the body or in insignia, seem to be a necessary part of leadership. Let's go back to Khafre. You see that Khafre is seated upright and in command. If you view him from the front, you cannot see that his head is enfolded by the wings of the Horus falcon carved behind him. This falcon's wings are carefully and realistically incised with feather patterns. The bird is carved in three dimensions where his head rises out of the stone behind Khafre's face and in relief where he subsides into the same body of stone as the pharaoh. What does his gesture mean? On one level, the melding of falcon and king represents the fact that the king is the living Horus, the embodiment of this god of the sky while he's on earth. Horus retains solar symbolism when he manifests himself in the king. The enfolding wings, however, add for us another, perhaps more emotional symbolism. They're protecting the king, perhaps ensuring his eternal life. Look down at the throne. The throne adds to this symbolism of Egyptian kingship. You see the lions on either side of the king's knees. Seen from the side, you will notice that the body of the lion in the throne extends to the rear, and the rear legs of the throne are those of a lion as well. They're carved in relief, unlike the frontal view of the throne, which is sculpted. Carved in high relief on the space between the throne's legs is the motif which symbolizes the union of Upper and Lower Egypt. It's called the Sematawi motif and consists of the knotted together stems of the plants of the two regions. 
The lily is used for Upper Egypt and the papyrus for Lower Egypt. The central sign is a large hieroglyph for Sem or Union. In this symbol, the central importance of the king is conveyed. He is the manifestation of the United Lands and the Uniter. This is a motif which continues for millennia in Egypt. It ties together notions of kingship, state, power, territory, creation, and control. Another interesting aspect of the sculpture is this. A massive back slab is used to support the carving of the Horus Falcon. This allows it to meld into the head of the king and his body below. It provides support and solidity to the whole. It is immovable and eternal. The body of the king is meant to be youthful and perfect, precisely the way you would want to look for eternity. The musculature, the commanding pose, and the symbols of kingship all combine to form an indelible impression of a powerful, ideal ruler. The quality of the carving is superb. It's skillfully modeled and combines three-dimensional with relief in a faultless manner. You don't notice the transitions at all. This is the mark of a master sculptor and artist. I'd like to give you an idea of how this was done. First, the artist marked the design on the stone, drew it. Then, the artist placed the chisel on the design marks and struck the chisel with the mallet in order to carve out the shape from the, from the cube. Finally, the artist smoothed and polished the carving with sand. You can see from our examination that the sculpture is meant to be viewed mostly from the front and is based on the shape of a cube. Egyptian sculpture is almost all characterized by what we call this cubic schema. It's how the sculptors conceptualize their statue as it emerged from a rectangular block of stu stone. They're faced with this rectangular block of stone, and it has to become a figure that is static and eternal. It can be viewed frontally or from the side, but it is not meant to be seen in any other view, nor is it meant to convey any movement. So this pose, so unmoving and majestic, was ideal for the funerary context, where you don't want liveliness and movement. Movement would not represent the true and eternal body of the king, nor would it be solemn and divine. This is the reason that much of Egyptian sculpture is static and does not depict motion. Movement, different perspectives, and experimentation are usually seen on the less important people depicted in the art of Egypt. That the context of this piece. Was it meant to be seen the way we look at sculpture today, walking around a piece in a museum setting? Of course not. Hardly any ancient art is seen today in the way it was intended to be placed centuries ago. This work was one of a series of 23 sculptures, similar but not exactly the same, of Khafre. They were installed at what we call the Valley Temple, connected to his pyramid. Imagine the pyramids in the Pyramid Age. They're bustling with life, like a small city compound, with priests and laymen making offerings. The massive bulk of the pyramid lies towards the west, in the desert realm associated with the dead. The pyramid of Khafre, then 471 feet high, contains the actual burial chamber. But on the eastern front of the pyramid was a pyramid temple. It was used for the cult of the king's ka, or life force, or soul. Khafre's temple was more elaborate than any before him, it included an entrance hall, a center court, niches for statues, and even storage rooms. Attached to this temple was a long causeway which led eastward to the Valley Temple. The Valley Temple was on greener land and marked the place where the sun rose, the east. It placed the king in the realm of the solar cycle where the sun is reborn endlessly. The king at this time became more definitely associated with the sun. The pyramid shape itself was a sun symbol based on the sacred Benben stone at Heliopolis. 
Indeed, Kafre's name incorporates the name of the sun god Re or Ra. At death, the king was meant to join Re in an eternal cycle of renewal, as Gay Robbins, an Egyptologist, puts it. Khafre's valley temple is quite grand. It's T-shaped and had a double entrance to the east. The walls there are still preserved to an astonishing height of 43 feet. A great hypostyle hall with large columns would have exhibited the 23 now mostly lost statues of Khafre. Imagine a whole assemblage of massive, exquisitely carved statues of the king, of which this was just one example. Red granite walls contrasted with alabaster floors and sunlight streamed onto the streaked bluish-black diorite statues. What a stunning tableau. The wealth and power implied by both the extraordinary distance from which these stones came, along with their number and sheer size, must have impressed any visitor immensely. The statues had a religious purpose. They were part of the cult of the dead king. They were meant to receive offerings of food, drink, and prayer, and a retinue of priests was dedicated to continuing the king's cult and ensuring his immortal life. Of course, in reality, after a time, both money and memory faded, and the temples were more or less abandoned. What we do have left of Khafre's mortuary art is impressive. We have the Great Sphinx, a wonder of the ancient world. The Sphinx, 66 feet high and 240 feet long, is thought to be from Khafre's reign. In fact, it has a temple set up that is very similar to Khafre's. You can see that the Sphinx wears a nemesis. His features are just like Khafre's, even though his nose is now gone thanks to a medieval vandal. A sphinx is essentially a recumbent lion's body with a human head. And both the size and scale of this one are amazing. The head itself is carved out of living rock. They cut into rock that was already there. But the rest has been partially built up by stone blocks. The temple in front of the sphinx has a double entrance and center court just like Khafre's Valley Temple next door. There's a niche at the eastern end of the temple which is aligned with both the Sphinx and the setting of the sun at the equinoxes. According to the Egyptologist Mark Lehner, the setting sun would renew the power of the dead king and, like him, enter the underworld where Re and Osiris are united. Sphinxes certainly seem to be a brilliant Egyptian invention. They're copied in art all over the ancient Near East and still have resonance today. What was so great about the Egyptian form was that they knew how to cleverly mask that awkward transition of the lion's body to the human head, either with a mane or a nemesis, head cloth. In fact, the Egyptian predilection for animal-human synthesis in artworks is a form of sculptural genius. The choice of the lion for the colossal depiction of the king, captures and uses the lion's regal demeanor and power as the king of beasts. Here, there's probably another strain of metaphor which goes unacknowledged, at least on a conscious level, by the Egyptians and most scholars. The lion, fierce and brave predator, was also one of the most territorial of beasts. His roaring, at dawn and dusk, made him a messenger of the sun's passage. So a guarding, solar-linked animal makes a lot of sense on the most visceral level in this location. This statue of Khafre is almost universally acknowledged to be one of the great masterpieces of the ancient world, but it also said a lot about the civilization that produced it. It's rarely put into its context, but that context was important. It combined an extraordinary number of symbols of kingship, and these extended to its original location. Khafre had this extraordinary complex built with an enormous pyramid, temples, and statuary. It's mind-boggling. Contrary to popular belief, those who worked on building pyramids and temples weren't slaves. 
They were well-fed and most likely proud of their labor. They were building a set of temples for divinity, after all, so it's a bit like having the faithful pitch in to build a cathedral. In addition, they were gainfully employed by the state, and this ensured both economic stability and social cohesion. After Khafre's death, the third and smallest of the Great Pyramids was built by his son, Menkau Re, called Mycerinus by the Greeks. It's possible that Menkau Re died during the building of his pyramid because it remained unfinished, and his valley temple and other structures were finished in mud brick, not in stone like his predecessors. The American archaeologist who excavated the valley temple of Menkau Re, George Reisner of Harvard, was extraordinarily lucky he discovered some of the greatest sculpture known from the Old Kingdom, some of which now resides in Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. Just to compare to Khafre, look at this alabaster statue of Menka Re. It's colossal and seems to have been the sole cult image for the king at this time. Note how his pose, his muscularity, even his headgear differ very little from his predecessors. In fact, you can see how closely his nose resembles his father's. There's a remarkable continuity in style and features. One of my favorite sculptures from Egypt, and one of the finest, is another in Boston. This fabulously carved, forceful portrayal of King Menkaure and his queen is one of the greatest treasures of Egyptian Old Kingdom art in the U.S., it makes a good comparison with the statue of his father, Khafre. Why? Because it shows us some new trends developing, and yet it stays in the tradition of Egyptian depictions of the king. This sculpture was one of many such group images found in Menkare's Valley Temple. The Valley Temple cult seems to have been emphasized more at Menkare's time. If you look closely at this image of Menkau Re, you can again see that both queen and king resemble each other and Khafre. The queen has the same sort of nose and similar features, and she was pr probably related to the ruling family as well. The most notable thing about this statue of the pair of royals is that it fulfills every demand of Egyptian mortuary sculpture. It is eternal, ideal, timeless, and grand. It is also, however, unfinished. The high gloss of the polished faces segues into rough-hewn, unpolished feet and base. There are traces of the original paint on Menkaure's head around the ear. If you look at the faces, they have all the qualities of Khafre's, idealized, no emotion, just a serene gaze, and finely modeled features. The king wears the same identifying paraphernalia, nemes, shendit, false beard. He's muscular, youthful, and vigorous. Perfect. He steps forward with his left foot, yet seems motionless. This becomes the standard position for Egyptian statuary and is even borrowed later by the Greeks. While the structure of the kneecap and shin isn't quite realistic, the patella is squarish, the overall impression is of masculine power. His queen is similar. She's slim, young, shapely, and the ideal of the perfectly feminine. Her form-fitting dress hides very little, and her left arm wraps the king in a protective embrace. When you understand the context of these Egyptian sculptures, you learn that they signify so much more than what is evident at first. They're not only masterpieces of ancient art, but they also play an important part in promoting the religious ideology of the state. They are cult objects, the focus of offerings, and they house the dead king spirit. They also place the dead king of Egypt in the center of the world, positioned as a divine being living for eternity. The king is likened to the sun god and the solar cycle of renewal in the east-west axis of his pyramid temple complex. His sculpture is inscribed with insignia like the Sematawi, which promotes the central role of the king in uniting the state of Egypt. 
and he is protected by and identified with the sky god Horus. We'll see this sort of complex iconography or symbolism in many other tombs of rulers. The Maya ruler, Pakal the Great, for instance, is similarly positioned after death as central to creation, the solar cycle, and the agricultural cycle of his land. He's reborn in this sarcophagus cover, and we can now read it clearly and understand the sort of ideology that it promotes. Both Pakal and Kafre were envisioned as deities and as the source of the wealth and abundance of their people. When they died, their subjects were quite motivated to provide them with a spectacular send-off, for they were hoping to join them in the afterlife. The cult of the king was central to every person's chances for having a proper eternal life in the hereafter. Life could continue after death without hunger, thirst, or discomfort if the proper provisions were made and the gods were honored. One also went through a final judgment and had to live a life of good without committing social evils. The send-off to the afterworld is well described in an Egyptian text, the story of Sinue. A procession is made for you on the day of joining the earth. The mummy case of gold, the head of lapis lazuli, the sky above you as you lie in the bier, oxen drawing you, chanters preceding you, funerary dances are done for you at the mouth of your tomb. This text sets the scene for our next masterpiece, which comes from the richest tomb ever discovered in ancient Egypt. Gold and lapis lazuli were fashioned into the famous King Tutankhamun's tomb mask. This mummy mask is known for its stupendous use of gold, but we'll be looking at its remarkable artistry. We'll also examine Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings and see what the Egyptians provided for their king in the hereafter. Because this tomb dates to more than 1,200 years after the age of the pyramids, we'll also be able to see the remarkable continuity of Egyptian artistry as well as some of its changes.